Good morning. How's your day going so far? <laughs> hey, today's the day that the Lord has made, so let us rejoice and be glad in it. Amen? Amen. Amen. Hey, my name is Pastor Ryan. I'm, a, I'm blessed to be the lead pastor here at Peace Church. Let me just say this to you here in the worship center. I also want to say this to those in our venue, to those in our gym, and of course those who are joining us online. Good morning to you. If you are here with us, either in person or in spirit, it's because you're meant to be here. It's because God wants you here, and I'm thankful that you're here. I'm thankful because we're starting a new sermon series today, and I'm really excited about this one, Pure Religion. You know, if you were to ask, I think, modern-day Christians, especially those maybe of the younger persuasion, they would tell you that they don't have a religion. They have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And to be honest with you, there's parts of that that I really resonate with. There's parts of that that I really appreciate. Because you got to understand what they're saying here. What they're saying is, saying is that they don't have a religion as in meaning that they don't follow a religious rule of practice that's really a veiled self-righteousness in an attempt to try to please some sort of God. Right? If that's religion, then absolutely we reject that. I mean, they'll go on to say and they'll point to how Jesus was the most harsh towards the religious leaders. They'll even go back to the Old Testament and they'll say, if you look at the Old Testament, God would reject the worship of people if their heart was not in it. And they'll say, because what God really wants is a relationship with you. And to be honest with you, like, that, that's my goal. Like, I want you to have a relationship with God. I mean, Jesus Christ came to this earth so that we could be reconciled to God. To be reconciled means to be in a right relationship. See, we've got this problem between us and God, and it's our sin. Our sin keeps our relationship with God from being what it should be. It keeps us at odds with him. And Jesus comes to die on a cross to take that sin, to take that punishment, so that that would no longer be a barrier between us, so that we could be in a right relationship with him. But hear me on this. While I want you to have a right relationship with God, hear me clearly, that's not a partnership. He is still God, and you are still not. You know, I think a lot of times when people talk about this concept of grace, which we emphatically affirm, that we are not saved by what we do. We are saved by what Jesus has done. But that does not mean that we now get to do whatever we want. God is still God. He has still given us a way of life that we are supposed to live into and lead. See, we reject, and I, I, I try to stay away from like big, useless words, but I'm going to give you a big word this morning because I think it's important for our conversation. This word, antinomian. Antinomian basically is this idea that people believe that because we're saved by grace and not by what we do, that we now are also free from the moral law of God that we no longer have to follow the moral teachings because we're not saved by those. We're saved by grace. We are saved by grace, but we reject this idea of antinomianism. Jesus is really clear. If you love me, he says, we will, what? Obey his commands. The last thing he tells his, his disciples before he goes back to heaven is, go into all the world and, and teach them to obey my commands. We still have a moral law that we follow. We still have a way that we are supposed to treat others. We still have a sexual ethic. We still follow what God has taught us through Jesus Christ and through the pages of Scripture. So again, if religion is defined as a spiritual rule of practice, which earns favor from our deity, we reject that. But if religion means following the instructed ways of God our Savior, then I'm in. But it doesn't matter what I think, it matters what God has said. And that's what this whole series is about, pure religion. Religion as defined by the heart of God. So during this sermon series, we're going to be looking at some selections from the book of James. For the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at these couple verses here. James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. Let me read that for you, and then we will get going. James chapter 1, verses 26 and 27. James writes... If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is okay. I just want to make sure I'm uh, worthless. Wow, worthless. Verse 27 religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this 
to visit widows, or to visit orphans and widows in their affliction, and to keep oneself unstained from the world. Wow. Thanks for clearing that up, James. That's God's word, everyone. Let's pray, and then we'll get to it. Let's pray. Father God, we do thank you for this morning. And we ask, Lord, in your goodness, don't let us reject religion if it's what you want for us, but help us to know fully what this religion means for our life and for our faith. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, help us to know these words more truly, Father, so that we may know you more deeply. It's in the precious and perfect and powerful name of Jesus we pray these things. And everyone said, amen. Amen. So I have to confess with you, of all the books in the Bible, James is my least favorite. I love every book in the Bible. I just love James the least. Of the 108 verses in the book of James, he gives us 59 commands. There's no story. There's no narrative. He is just telling us what to do the entire time. I was once invited to a men's Bible study. I said, oh, that sounds interesting. They said, yeah, we're studying the book of James. Yeah, no thanks. but it is God's word. And so we have to take time to seek and savor what he's speaking to us in the midst of this. But who is he? Who is this James? Well, as we start this sermon series, I wanted to introduce you to James. So let's talk about the journey of James. Who is this guy? James, or actually in Hebrew, the name is actually Jacob. It's a very common Jewish name. This is not the James that was one of the original 12 disciples of Jesus. That James is the brother of John, the sons of Zebedee. That James died early on as one of the first martyrs in Acts chapter 12. This James is the son of Mary. He is the brother of Jesus Christ. And even though James was his brother, he did not believe in Jesus as the Christ at first. He's even seen criticizing and mocking his brother at times. So what happened? What happens that James went from laughing at his brother to then, as we're going to see, to leading his brother's church? Well, Paul, the apostle, tells us what happens here. After Jesus Christ was resurrected from the dead, he visits James, his brother, and that leads to James' radical conversion. This is why we see James at Pentecost with the rest of the disciples. It's James himself, James, along with Peter and John, are the ones who commissioned the Apostle Paul to his work as a missionary. And James rises to become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. And he, over, he also presides over an extremely critical meeting of the church that we see in the book of Acts. It's called the Jerusalem Council. And they're confronted with this problem. What do we do with all these people who are not Jewish, who are coming to faith in Jesus? Are they supposed to follow the law or not? There's this huge meeting. You got like the masters of the faith all speaking into this. Uh, Paul speaks into this. Peter speaks into this. But then James, as the leader of the church, he's the one who stands up and gives the final thoughts on what is supposed to happen with all these Gentiles. So again, we see James being the leader of the church church in Jerusalem. We even see him instructing Paul. He's giving Paul some mentoring in Acts chapter 21. And then at some point, some point in the 40s AD, James, the brother of Jesus, writes this letter in what would become to be known as the book of James. It's often nicknamed the Proverbs of the Old Testament, the, the Proverbs of the New Testament. It's an incredible journey that James goes on. Incredible testimony this man has. And then in 62 AD, under a trial led by the high priest named Annas the Younger, James was convicted of breaking Jewish law. And James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned to death and died a martyr. The book of James was written by a man with a radical, an unbelievably radical testimony. His words inspired by the Holy Spirit are as authoritative as they are challenging to us and as they were to the first Christians that he wrote to. 
See, when James first wrote this book, he didn't write this book to one set of Christians. He didn't write, uh, he didn't write this to one set of Christians in one certain town or one certain church. James says in the beginning of his book, he says that he wrote this to the 12 tribes of the dispersion, which is a very Jewish tailored way to say that he is writing to all Christians scattered across the land. Again, in this book, there's no narrative. There's no story. There's, there's not even a clear articulation of the gospel as in being the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. See, James just kind of knows that who he is writing to are already Christians, so he has no problem cutting right to the chase and saying, here's how you're supposed to live the Christian life. Here's what you're supposed to do. Here's what you're not supposed to do if you want to be, call yourself a real Christian. And that's what James does. He says to us, if we were to meet James and we'd say, we are, we are Christians, he would say, you are? Okay, well... Do you bridle your tongue? Do you take care of the orphans and the widows? Are you keeping yourself unstained from the world? That's how James says, that's how I know you'll be a, if you're a Christian or not. So you can see why he's not exactly my favorite guy. He just lays it down. He just lays it down. So, again, those three key outlines, bridle our tongue, care for the widows and for the orphans, and to remain unstained. That's kind of what we're going to be looking at for the next few weeks. And so today, today, we're going to talk about bridling our tongue, the testimony of the tongue as so much it feeds into the validity of our faith. So let's look at this statement from the brother of James himself. If anyone thinks he is religious and does not bridle his tongue but deceives his heart, this person's religion is worthless. Let's just camp out on this word bridle here for a minute. Now, James' original audience would have been very familiar and would have known exactly what this word meant. They would have gotten this imagery immediately, and I think even many of us here understand this. He's talking about the bridle of a horse. And so, just so that you know that I know what I'm talking about, I'm going to show you a picture from my past. That is me back in my rodeo days. That is my horse score. Uh, what we would do for fun is we would uh, just gallop as fast as we could from one end of the arena to the other, and I'd jump off full gallop, and I'd run down, and I'd tie a goat up. I mean, I'm the one who did that, and I think it's weird, okay? <laughs> so this is my horse score, and this headset, for many of you know, that, that's called a bridle. And part of the bridle is what's known as a bit. It's a metal bar. does not hurt the horse, but it goes into the horse's mouth. And, of course, this is attached by the reins and from which you would control the horse. You would tell him how fast you wanted to go, how slow you wanted to go, what direction. It was how you were in control of the horse. It's how I was in control of my horse score. So what James is saying here is that if we, if we don't bridle our tongues... If we don't have control over what we say, then, we're, then we are showing the world two things. You're deceiving yourself, and your religion is worthless. You're deceiving yourself, and your religion is worthless. James is like, yeah, if you lack self-control over your own mouth, if you give in to slander, if you give in to gossip, if you give in to swearing or crude humor, if you belittle people, if you criticize your husband when he's not around, if you are a liar, James says that you are no devout person. You are a deceived person, and you're only deceiving yourself. James is clear. Everyone else knows that your religion is fake. You're only deceiving yourself here if you have no bridle on your tongue. He's saying that you can't see what everyone else sees, that your words mean something. And your words show the world something about you. And Peace Church, this goes for what we say in public, in what we say in private, in what we text, and most certainly what we put online. James says, if you don't have control over your mouth, your religion is worthless. That word there in the original language is the word mateos. We see it often applied to pagan religions. Pagan religions are mateos. They're fake, they're hollow, they're in vain. They don't worship a real God. They are worthless. James ties this all back to the power of our 
words. You got to wonder, you know, where did James get this idea? Why are words so important to James? I'm going to tell you where he got this notion. It's from his big brother, Jesus Christ. It was Jesus Christ who said, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Gentlemen in the house, let me speak to you as men for a moment. As a fellow man, husband, and father. If you're like me, you think your words are like this piece of paper. I often think my words are like this piece of paper. See, I can, I can write love, love notes to my wife on this. When I'm in a jovial mood, I can make a paper airplane and play with my kids. But I think my words are worth as much as this piece of paper. And see, like, I, I, I think this because I, when I get upset, that's what I do with my words. In my anger, I get frustrated and I throw it. But you know what? In my heart, in my heart, I know it's just a piece of paper. That was just a moment of anger. I, I could throw that at my three-year-old daughter and it ain't going to hurt her. Right? I mean, it's just a piece of paper. James says that's, you couldn't be further from the truth. In fact, he says your words are more like this rock. Man, would you ever throw this at your wife? Parents, would you ever throw this at your kids? Absolutely not. Because we know the power of this rock. I'm going to tell you now, your words have more power. In fact, I'm going to take it one step further. Your words are not like that rock. Your words are bullets. And your mouth is a loaded weapon. And I stand before you now not as a perfect man. I stand before you as a man who has had to seek apology because I have shot my wife and I have shot my kids with my words. You better believe my knees are knocking as I await judgment day. And my life is a, one of daily repentance for what comes out of this mouth. But the Spirit's working on me. And he's calling me to bridle my tongue. And that's my challenge for you guys. This is why we need the Spirit so deeply in our lives. We can't do this on your own. You'll give into your flesh. You will throw that piece of paper at someone. You need the Spirit to come into your life. James says, I tell you, or Jesus says, I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. In the Old Testament, we see this death and life are in the power of the tongue. Goodness. Goodness. Words are not a wadded up piece of paper. Words are even more than rocks. They're bullets. And we walk around with a loaded weapon. What are we going to do with it? I tell you, on the day of judgment, people will give account for every careless word they speak. Gentlemen, go ahead and just trade out that word careless for in anger, for stupid, for vulgar. Everything you say, you're going to have to give an account for before the Lord one day. Men, let me tell you right now, you are a cowboy. Men, you're a cowboy and your horse is your words. And when a cowboy rides his horse, if he's a true cowboy, he's in control of that horse. That horse ain't in control of him. So bridle your words. Women. I think this is all about the guys here today. No, no, no. I got something for you too, ladies. <laughs> ladies, men on average speak 7,000 words a day. Ladies, you speak upwards of 20,000 words a day. So just mathematically speaking, just, just simple math here, you have a nearly three times greater chance of getting in trouble for what you say than the guys do. I'm preaching, boy. <laughs> but I want to remind us all, it's not just hurtful words that are powerful. Kind and encouraging and loving words are powerful too. Men and women, you know, I, if you've been at Peace Church before, you know I've said this before, that your family, your house is a cornfield, and your words are the rain. Now, a good summer rain 
can produce great crops, but a fierce thunderstorm will destroy them. At one point, Jesus is getting into some hard teachings, and uh, people start leaving him. They say, this is what you got to say, Jesus, this is too hard for me, and they start leaving. And Jesus turns to his 12 disciples, and he says, are you guys going to leave too? And I love what Peter says. Peter says, who else should we go to, Lord? You have the words of eternal life. I tell you what, I want my wife and I want my kids to be around me and want to be around me because of the words of life that I speak to them. So with all this, let me give you one subpoint. Bridle does not mean muzzle. The Lord himself has given you a voice and I want you to use that voice for his glory. As you seek to promote love and truth in this world, Bridle does not mean muzzle. Let your words be from a pure religion that seeks to lift up the name of Jesus, that seeks to love your neighbor and the world around us, that shares the truth of the gospel with a watching world. So as we close, let me give you three very common principles for when we do choose to speak. Speak words that are true. Speak words that are timely. And speak words with the right tone. So true, timely, and with the right tone. The first one should be easy. Of course, we only say things that are true, but let me take it one step further. I'm not talking about words that are just simply factually accurate. I'm talking about words that, in a sense, have this substance of glory in them, that they are strong and noble words, that they are sound and firm words, words that you will want to own on Judgment Day. Listen to me. Everything that is said needs to be true, but... Not everything that is true needs to be said. With that, it has to do with our idea, idea of timing. Yup, we can say the right things at the wrong time, can't we? Like in the middle of a heated argument, maybe with your spouse, maybe with your political opponent. See, where the first point had to do with truth, this one has to do with wisdom. Wise words are words that are not just important to hear, but wise words are words that are said at the right time. So let our words be truthful and timely in truth and in wisdom, but also let them be said with the right tone. And the Bible is pretty clear on what the tone should be. It needs to be in love. The Bible says to speak the truth in love. Scripture reminds us that words that are not spoken from love are just clanging symbols. Tell you what, these three rules, these three here, they keep me from posting a lot of stuff online. I haven't always obeyed these rules, as history would maybe show you. You know, what's the, the Hulk? What's, the, what's his name when he's not the Hulk? Bruce, Bruce Banner? What is, what's that thing he says? You wouldn't like me when I'm angry? Well, you know what Ryan Kimmel says? You wouldn't like me when I'm unbridled. In fact, I wouldn't like you when you're unbridled. And James knows that nobody's meant to be unbridled because unbridled people have a worthless religion. That we are meant to live into the Holy Spirit, to let him to live in us and to produce these fruits in us and of which is is self-control. So bridle your tongue and you will show your family and you will show the world that you are a strong person empowered by the Holy Spirit to bear the fruit of self-control. Control As you speak words that are true, out of truth, you speak words that are timely, that are wise, and you speak words that are with the right tone and that are in love. You know, of all the things that James, the brother of Jesus, could have told us about a pure religion, he starts off by reminding us of the power of our words. And so is it any wonder that the Bible calls Jesus the word? The book of James, arguably the most famous of all the New Testament books, or the book of John. The book of John starts off by saying that Jesus is the Word. He says the Word was with God and the Word was God. And then John says that this Word became flesh, that the Word became a man, Jesus, that God spoke his love into creation with a true Word at just the right time. And through this Word, we see the love of God in his Son, Jesus Christ, 
who is the word made into a person who would die on the cross for our sins. See, God, God declared his love for the world when he sent his son into the world to save us from our sins, to be our savior, to die on the cross in our place. I'm telling you right now, that should have been me up on that cross. That should have been me because of the words that I've spoken in my life. That should have been me hanging up there. But my Savior, who is the Word, did it for me when my words failed me. When my words will condemn me, the Word of God saved me. And I'm here to tell you he will do the same for you. Men, if you look back on your life, if you're like me, you hate some of the things you've said. I'm here to tell you right now, God will remember your sins no more when you place your trust and your faith in him. The one who has come to take away that sin. The word, to be the true word that we could never speak on our own. Don't waste another moment. I don't know how much time is left. And that's not a scare tactic. That's just the truth. God is calling you to himself through his son to be in a right religion, in a right relationship with him. But that is only through Jesus. Would you please stand with me as we prepare our hearts to close in worship? See, the beautiful thing about this word, Jesus Christ, is that the grave could not silence this word. For by his power, Jesus has been raised to life to show the world what the true word is. If you repent and put your trust in him, then by his word, by the blood of the Savior, you will be saved. Jesus did this so that we could have a pure religion, to have a right relationship with God. Would you pray with me? Father, I pray that everyone who is listening to me now, Lord, that they would deal with the real hard fact, Lord, that their words are what will condemn them at the end of the day. But I pray, Lord, that as we look on the Savior, we'll see, God, that your word is what saves us. Your Son has come to save us when we could not save ourselves, when our own words would condemn us. Your true word has saved us. So, Father, I pray that here and now that we would lift up a true word of praise as we worship our Savior. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.